he had one of the greatest college careers of all time, culminating in an improbable NCAA title. He entered the league as a can't miss prospect with a good post game and a unique ability to face up. He had good range, but could still finish at the rim. And on top of that, he was a 6'10 power forward who ran like a gazelle, could put the ball on the floor, and was a great passer for his size. But unfortunately, Danny Manning's knees gave out on him incredibly early in his career. And at a time when an ACL injury could easily be considered career ending, he came back and was selected to two All-Star games. Then just as he got himself in a potentially championship situation, his knees once again pulled a rug out from under him. But as he showed in the past, he was too determined of a player to let this affect him. And he would come back again to become one of the top bench players in the league and continue to stick around the league for 15 years. Yeah, he missed a lot of games in his career, but his career could have been over before it even started. And he was a player that was all about winning and would always put his ego to the side. And that's a guy everyone wants on their team. So today, we're going to take a closer look at the resilient career of a player who was ahead of his time in Danny Manning. Let's jog your memory. Danny Manning, son of former ABA and NBA player Ed Manning, spent his freshman through junior years of high school at Page High School in North Carolina, where he would lead the Page Pirates to an undefeated 26-0 record and a state title, while averaging about 19 points and 9 rebounds and earning all state honors in his junior season. He would transfer to Lawrence High School in Kansas for his senior season due to his father becoming an assistant coach at the University of Kansas where Manning would be named All-State and a McDonald's All-American his senior year. Manning impressed so much in high school that he was one of two high schoolers invited to attend the initial trials to select the 1984 Olympic basketball team. Manning would attend the University of Kansas under head coach Larry Brown, where he would be a freshman starter in the 1985 season. Even as a freshman, Manning established himself as a premier player in the nation, as he was second on the team in points per game and first in rebounds and steals, while shooting over 56% from the field. Manning would help lead the Jayhawks to a 26-8 overall record, which included an NCAA tournament berth. The Jayhawks would beat the Ohio Bobcats 49-38 in a low-scoring first round, where Manning would score 9 points on 4-5 shooting. The second round versus Auburn would see Manning in foul trouble, as he only managed 22 minutes of play, as well as shot just 3-12 of 12 from the field for 7 points. And the Tigers, led by Chuck Person, took advantage of Manning's struggles to win the game by two. And Manning's freshman season would see him average about 14.5 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 3 assists per game. Manning would take a step forward during his sophomore year, as he led the team in scoring while shooting 60% from the field. His rebounding numbers dropped slightly, but he would average over two steals and over one block per game. Kansas had an experienced team with three seniors in the starting lineup and they would finish with an overall record of 35-4, which led to the team being a one seed in the tournament. Manning would average about 14.5 points and 4 rebounds throughout a great Kansas run that saw them make it to the Final Four, with Manning's best performance coming in an Elite 8 win versus NC State, where Manning put up 22 points on about 65% shooting. However, the Final Four versus Duke was a rough showing for Manning, as he would score just 4 points on 2 of 9 shooting, and couldn't get much going as he was in foul trouble most of the game, eventually fouling out, which led to a 4 point loss. This would be the second game of the tournament, along with the Sweet 16 versus Michigan State, that Manning would foul out. But Manning's sophomore season saw him put up about 16.5 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game, while earning his first Conference Player of the Year award and a second team All-American selection. The Jayhawks lost seniors Ron Kellogg, Calvin Thompson, and Greg Drayling going into the 1987 season. So with those guys gone, Manning and senior Cedric Hunter were the only players on the team to average double figures. But Manning would do as much as he could to make up for the loss, as he was one of the top players in the nation and would up his scoring by over 7 points per game, while putting up a career best in rebounds and shooting percentage at nearly 62%. But Kansas really missed their seniors, as they went from the 10th best scoring team in the nation in 1986 to 133rd in 87. However, they would still be good enough for a tournament berth, as they qualified with a 23-10 record. Manning had a modest first round versus Houston, putting up just 12 points on about 46% shooting. But he would explode for 42 points on over 61% from the field in a second round win versus Missouri State. They would draw Reggie Williams and Georgetown in the Sweet 16, and even though Manning played the full 40 minutes, putting up 23-12 and 12 on over 56% from the field, 
No one else on the team cracked 10 points, and Williams' 34 was too much for the Jayhawks as they lost. And for his junior season, Manning would average about 24 points, 9.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game, while also being named a first team All-American and Conference Player of the Year. 1988 would be the tour of Danny and the Miracles, as Manning would lead the team with a great season, but the Jayhawks were just 21 and 11 entering the tournament, so they weren't exactly favored to win it all. But they would proceed to go on a run for the ages, led by Manning. Manning would have 24 and 12 in a first round win versus Xavier, followed by 25 to beat Murray State. Manning's 38 led Kansas to a 13 point win over Vanderbilt in the Sweet 16, and he would then score 20 in another 13 point win versus Mitch Richmond and rival Kansas State in the Elite Eight. Manning would then avenge his terrible tournament performance versus Duke two years earlier, as this year he would have 25 and 10 in an upset of Danny Ferry and the Blue Devils. This would set up a matchup versus a powerhouse Oklahoma team led by future NBA players Harvey Grant, Mookie Blaylock, and Stacey King, a team that Kansas lost to twice in the regular season. But this incredible game was different, and after a wild second half, the Jayhawks came out victorious behind Manning's 31-point, 18-rebound performance to win just the second national championship in program history. With Manning earning the Most Outstanding Player Award to go along with the Wooden Award, Naismith Award, another first team All-American selection, and his third straight Big 8 Player of the Year. And Manning would conclude his Kansas career with season averages of about 25 points, 9 rebounds, 2 assists, 2 steals, and 2 blocks per game. Manning would be entering the 1988 NBA Draft, but before that, he would participate in the 1988 Seoul Summer Olympics, where the team would disappointingly finish with a bronze medal. The first time in history, Team USA didn't bring home the gold. Manning would play well overall, averaging about 11.5 points and 6 rebounds on 57% from the field, but would disappear in the most important game versus the Soviet Union, as he would be held scoreless. Manning's college career left him as the unquestioned number one pick, and the Clippers made that clear when they took just 28 seconds to make Manning the first overall selection. The Clippers also orchestrated a draft day trade, to secure the 76ers third overall pick, Charles Smith out of Pittsburgh, in hopes of creating a great duo in LA for years to come. But that excitement would be short-lived, as Manning would tear his ACL in a January 4th game versus Milwaukee, after playing just 26 games up to that point. And what made this even worse was that Manning was really starting to play well, as prior to the Milwaukee game, he had scored at least 21 points in 6 of his last 9 games, while scoring double figures in all 9. And although the Clippers weren't doing much with a record of 10 and 20 at the time of the injury, they would then go 11 and 41 the remainder of the season, finishing 21 and 61. And Manning's shortened rookie season would see him average about 16 and a half points, six and a half rebounds, and three assists per game. Manning would return from his injury 11 games into the 1990 season and came back strong as he scored 21 points on 70% shooting in just 20 minutes of play his first game back. The Clippers had an improvement on the year before, as they finished 30 and 52, but would still miss the playoffs. Manning would only start 42 of the 71 games he played this season, but would still finish third on the team in scoring, behind his draft mate Charles Smith and shooting guard Ron Harper, who was acquired from Cleveland in mid November. Unfortunately, Harper would only play 28 games for the Clippers before he suffered a torn ACL of his own. Nonetheless, Manning looked good coming back from his ACL injury. And for his second year, he averaged about 16.5 points, 6 rebounds, and 2.5 and assists per game. Manning would follow a similar trend in the 91 season of starting and coming off the bench, as he started 47 of the 73 games he played in. And even though his scoring dropped again, he was still efficient, shooting over 51%. Charles Smith continued his solid play, leading the team in scoring for the first time in his career. Harper would eventually return from injury to play 39 games this season and the Clippers continued to receive great contributions from Ken Norman. Unfortunately, there wasn't much of a change in the team's performance, even with the late season return of Harper, as the team would finish at 31-51, and 51, missing the playoffs again. And the 91 season saw Manning average about 16 points, 6 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. 1992 finally saw a healthy Harper and Manning, as they would each play and start in all 82 games resulting in Manning's best season up to that point as he would finish first on the team in scoring, shoot over 54%, and pull down a career high in rebounds. 
The Clippers also added a piece to their offense, which they were sorely missing, when they acquired point guard Doc Rivers in a draft day trade to bring defense and veteran leadership to their young team. Rivers wouldn't make the best first impression as he held out of training camp as he wanted a contract extension, which the Clippers would not oblige to. And this was probably a good decision, as Rivers started just 25 of the 59 games he managed this year. But the Clippers really couldn't shake the injury bug, as Smith would miss 33 games with a knee injury suffered early in the year. On top of this, the Clippers went through three coaches this year, starting the year 21-24 and 24 with Mike Schuler, then going 1-1 one and one in two games under Mac Calvin, before Manning was reunited with his college coach, Larry Brown, who led the Clippers to a 23-12 and 12 record in his 35 games, to finish the year 45-37 and 37 and make their first playoff appearance in the Manning era. And the Clippers entered the first round series versus Utah with a pretty much healthy team, and Manning played a great series, as they took the Jazz the distance, and even though they dropped the first two games, they won the next two before losing in Game 5, which would include a 33-point, 10-rebound performance from Manning in Game 4. And for the regular season, Manning averaged about 19.5 points, 7 rebounds, and 3.5 assists per game. Prior to the 1993 season, the Clippers were part of a three-team trade with Orlando and New York that saw them send Rivers and Smith to the Knicks, and among other assets, received point guard Mark Jackson and center Stanley Roberts in return. The Clippers could not improve on their record from the season prior, as they finished 41-41, and 41, but would boast a top 10 offense in the league, with all five starters averaging over 11 points per game, and each playing at least 76 games. Manning would have arguably his best season, as he averaged a career high in points on his fourth straight season of over 50% from the field, which would earn him his first All-Star selection. Even with their average record, the Clippers made it back to the playoffs, where they would once again take a much better team the distance, as they would split the first four games with the Houston Rockets before losing Game 5 by four points. Manning would lead the team in scoring for the second straight postseason, but wouldn't have the same shooting success as he shot just over 41%, but would have 24-12 and 12 in Game 5. A couple interesting points of this season was that Manning had indicated a desire to be traded as he was ready to move on from Larry Brown. Additionally, a trade fell through between the Clippers and the Hornets that would have sent Kendall Gill to the Clippers and Manning to the Hornets to team with Larry Johnson and Alonzo Mourning. But for Manning's 93 season, he would average nearly 23 points, 6.5 rebounds, and 2.5 assists per game. Larry Brown would resign from the Clippers after the season to take a job with Indiana, so you'd think that would solve the issue of Manning wanting to leave but Manning would still end up declining a five-year, $25 million extension prior to the 94 season, instead signing a one-year deal for $3.2 million, virtually guaranteeing that Manning would be leaving after the year. But the Clippers had another chance to deal Manning for some valuable talent, as there was an agreement on a trade with Miami that would have seen the Clippers acquire Glenn Rice and the Heat acquire Manning. And this was basically a done deal, as Manning had already said his goodbyes to his teammates and was prepared to join the Heat for an exhibition game. But then, disgraced Clippers owner Donald Sterling vetoed the trade. The reason why? He reportedly had a good dream about Manning that would result in him pulling out of the deal. So it was probably a little awkward going into the 94 season, but Manning was still a Clipper and would play great, as he was averaging nearly 24 points and 7 rebounds per game in 42 games for the Clippers which included a career-high 43 points in a December 7th loss to Chicago, as well as a career-high 18 rebounds in a February 1st loss to Phoenix. And this would earn him his second straight All-Star selection. But then, just 11 days after the All-Star game, Manning would finally be traded to the Atlanta Hawks for their disgruntled franchise legend, Dominique Wilkins. Manning would join a Hawks team in great position, as they were 37-16 and 16 at the time of the trade, and would go 20-9 and 9 the remainder of the way with Manning to finish the year 57 and 25. Manning would not have the same impact with the Hawks as he would average under 16 points in his 26 games with the team, but the Hawks would enter the playoffs as the one seed. Manning would up his game in the first round versus Miami as he would lead the team with 18 points per game in a five game defeat of the Miami Heat. Manning would continue his excellent play in the second round, upping his team leading scoring to close to 22 points per game on 50% shooting which included his playoff career high of 35 in a Game 4 loss. Unfortunately, Manning wouldn't get a lot of scoring help, as the Pacers would take the series in 6 games, and Manning's overall season averages would look like about 20.5 points, 
seven rebounds and four assists per game. Manning would prove to be just a rental for the Hawks, as he would sign a one-year, $1 million deal with the Suns in the offseason to play alongside Charles Barkley, Kevin Johnson, and Dan Marley, and the Suns looked primed to be title favorites for the 95 season. Manning would need to fill in for Barkley at the beginning of the season as Barkley nursed an abdominal injury, and Manning helped lead the team to an 8-3 start. But the Suns were at their best with Manning as a sixth man, as they were 23-4 when he came off the bench, and the Suns were 36-10 with Manning as their second leading scorer midway through the year. But then, in a February 6th practice, Manning would land on Joe Klein's foot and tear his other ACL, ending his season and his best chance at a title. The Suns would still make the playoffs, but would lose to the Rockets in the second round. And in Manning's 46 games, he would average nearly 18 points, 6 rebounds, and 3.5 and assists per game, on a career-high 54.7% from the field. Even with the risk of Manning being a shell of his former self, the Suns re-signed him to a 6-year, $40 million deal going into the 96 season. But this would not be the same Suns team, as Dan Marley had been dealt to the Cavs in the offseason, and Kevin Johnson began his late career injury woes, which limited him to 56 games this year. The Suns added one bright spot, however, in rookie Michael Finley. Manning returned on February 2nd, but the Suns were in a much different position than the season prior, as they were sitting at 19 and 24. Manning would play 33 games and finish fourth on the team in scoring, as he would help spark the Suns to finish 41 and 41 and draw the Spurs in the first round. But aside from a one point game three Suns win, the Spurs handled Phoenix pretty easily. Although Manning would be fourth on the team in scoring, and the only bench player to average double figures for the series. And Manning's regular season saw him average about 13.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game. Going into the 97 season, the Suns were a completely different team, as Barkley had been traded to Houston for a package headlined by Sam Cassell and Robert Ory. But the Suns had a nightmare start to the year, as after 13 games, they were 0-13, and head coach Cotton Fitzsimmons would resign after just eight games, replaced by Danny Ainge. Then on December 26th, with a record of eight and 19, Cassell and Finley headlined a deal that saw the Suns acquire star point guard Jason Kidd from the Mavs. Kidd and a relatively healthy KJ would breathe new life into the Suns as they would go 32 and 23 the remainder of the way to finish 40 and 42. While Manning had a quietly solid year as he was able to play in 77 games and finish as a top 5 scorer on the team, as well as have a 6 steal game versus Sacramento on March 7th. The Suns would make the playoffs and take on the Gary Payton and Sean Kemp led Sonics in round 1, in a series where they pushed the Sonics to 5 games before losing. Manning would have a very efficient series, as he put up about 13 points on nearly 58% shooting, which included a 19 point 10 rebound game 4. Manning's regular season stats looked like about 13.5 points, 6 rebounds, and 2 assists on over 53% from the field. The Suns made some great moves in the offseason, as they signed the late Clifford Robinson and also acquired up-and-coming forward Antonio McDice from the Nuggets. This extra scoring of Robinson and McDice, alongside Kidd and Rex Chapman, helped the Suns to the 6th best offense in the league. Johnson was only able to play 50 games, starting 12 of them, but second-year guard Steve Nash picked up some of the slack and Manning led the bench unit with a very similar season from the year prior, but would be recognized for his contributions as he won 6th man of the year for a 56 and 26 Suns team. Unfortunately, Manning would re-injure his right knee on April 8th versus the Kings. Although it wasn't a torn ACL, it was enough to keep him out for the remainder of the season and the playoffs, where the Suns would lose to the Spurs in 4 games. And for the regular season, Manning averaged about 13.5 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 2 assists per game on over 51% from the field. The lockout shortened season was probably exactly what Manning needed, as it gave him more time to recover from his knee injury, as he would play all 50 games. In a controversial turn of events, McDice returned to the Nuggets in free agency, leaving a big hole at the forward position, which the Suns would fill with a more than capable Tom Gugliotta. Nash was gone in a trade to the Mavs that landed the Suns the draft pick they would use to select Sean Marion in the upcoming year's draft. Even though the 32-year-old Manning would play the full season, this was the beginning of his career decline, as he would put up the lowest scoring average of his career up to that point, and his first season averaging less than double figures. Kidd would lead the team behind the best season of his career up to that point, and the Suns would finish 27-23, which got them a first-round matchup versus the Blazers, where they would be swept. But Manning would play well, 
as he started one out of the three games and put up over three points more than his regular season average and shot over 58%. And Manning's regular season looked like about nine points, four and a half rebounds, and two and a half assists per game. During the 99 offseason, Manning was included in the trade that brought Penny Hardaway to the Suns, but would then be traded to Milwaukee for the 2000 season. Manning would play 72 games at a reduced role, averaging just under 17 minutes a game, and seeing his averages take a steep drop across the board. The Bucks, behind their trio of Ray Allen, Glenn Robinson, and Sam Cassell, finished 42-40 and, and would lose to the Pacers in the first round of the playoffs. Manning would only get about 5 minutes of play for the entire series, recording one rebound. And for the regular season, Manning averaged about 4.5 points, 3 rebounds, and an assist per game. Manning would find himself on Utah for the 01 season, and although he played less than 16 minutes per game, would up his scoring by nearly 3 points from the year prior, including a 25-point game versus Portland on March 22nd. The Stockton and Malone-led Jazz would finish 53-29, but would lose to Dallas in 5 games in Round 1. Manning would see a much larger role as he averaged nearly 10 points on 56% shooting in the 5 games. And for the regular season, he put up about 7.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, and 1 assist per game. Manning would be a maverick for the 0-2 season, where his role continued to shrink and he would only appear in 41 games this year. The Mavs had a great season behind Manning's former teammates Michael Finley and Steve Nash, as well as Dirk Nowitzki, as they finished 57 and 25, but would get bounced in the second round by San Antonio, a playoffs that Manning would not play in as a lower back strain shut him down for the year in early March. And for the regular season, he would average about four points, two and a half rebounds, and half an assist per game. Manning would start 03 as a free agent before being signed by the Pistons in early February, where he would appear in 13 games, playing about seven minutes. The Pistons would go 50-32 and 32 and make a run to the Eastern Conference Finals before losing to New Jersey. Manning was available for the playoffs, but would only appear in brief spurts in four games. And for the regular season, he would average about 2.5 points, 1.5 rebounds, and half an assist per game. This would be Manning's last stop, as he would call it quits after a 15-year career filled with adversity. He came into the league with such high hopes, but it would all change before it could really get started. Even though his rookie year injury stole some of his athleticism, he showed a lot of resilience to return from an injury that was nowhere near as manageable as it is nowadays. And he didn't just come back to stick around. He returned and became a back-to-back all-star. Then just when things were looking up, his other knee went. And it went on a freak accident. But Manning's resilience continued to be on display as he came back and made the most of a bench roll and was recognized for it. His best chance at a title in Phoenix fell apart quickly. But that was largely due to the team changing so much during his time there and he stuck around the league as a selfless veteran for years after. Even though Manning wasn't the best defender, as he could quickly find himself in foul trouble, he was a versatile defender, and he still came into the league with an ability to use his quickness and athleticism to make some great defensive plays. But his injuries stole a lot of that ability, yet he would still end his career averaging basically a steal and a block per game. And maybe Manning didn't have the tough, rugged style of play that you wanted in a power forward at that time, but he brought something completely different to the table something very few power forwards could offer during his time. And at the end of the day, you can't help but wonder what an injury-free Danny Manning career would have looked like. But that's been today's episode on Danny Manning. Hope you enjoyed it, and remember to subscribe for more episodes like this one. If you liked this episode, check out this one on his teammate in Phoenix and Milwaukee, or this one on the player he was nearly traded for. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.